So I'm here with Dr. Heidi Forbes Hoster today, and we are looking at the topic of digital well-being. Now, Heidi is a very, uh, very experienced uh, proponent, researcher, author, uh, behavioral scientist, um, the host of the Evolving Digital Self and Global Nomad Hacks podcasts, uh, number one best-selling author with titles such as Digital Self Mastery, and a whole host of other things. We have a very illustrious uh, conversation <laughs> sort of person here with us today. So welcome, Heidi. Thank you so much, Neil. No, thank you for having me. So this kind of topic that we've um, decided to focus on, this whole concept of um, digital well-being, I guess in these times of, uh, for some people, sort of quite significant challenge, whereas some people are, are really riding on this and thinking this is wonderful um, with the whole isolation and distancing, but for a lot of people now having to rely on digital and seeing the impact and possibly negative effects on their well-being. I think this is obviously very, very timely that we're entering into this, into this conversation. I mean, you talk and interview a lot of people through the podcast, and hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about the podcast in a moment. Well, what kind of sort of trends in, in digital well-being are you seeing right now? Well, first, I want to sort of clarify what digital well-being is, if you don't mind, just because I think um, there's because when Google about, I guess it was about two years ago, added a digital well-being app onto, um, on, onto the Android devices, they sort of co-opted a term that we've been using for quite a long time. Um, and so unfortunately, people have only focused on when they hear digital well-being, they think we're talking about that Android version, which basically monitors your screen time and things like that. Digital well-being, one from the perspective of, of what I work with, is, is much bigger than that. It's, it's much more of a systemic perspective. It's about the human relationship with technology, but it's also about the, you know, the, the actual human bodily experience and psychological experience with the technology and how things like 5G and um, electromagnetic frequencies and design and interface um, impact the the, uh, the human ability to be human and to engage with others. Um, but, and then from another perspective, it's also looking at developing technologies that can enhance well-being. Um, so everything from the wellness and, um, and health, health and wellness side, but also looking at um, how the devices are developed so that you're not using behavioral science in unethically or you're not creating devices or technologies that are going to be harmful for humans. So there's a whole sort of range there that are all of those different comp uh, components are part of digital well-being. What we're experiencing right now Per, you know, each of us individually are having a digital well-being experience. And so it's a lot easier to talk about just the human interaction side. So I think what, you know, what we should focus on in our conversation, just because people can relate to it the most, and I think your listeners will really understand, right now we're sort of in a, a love-hate relationship with technology where it's sort of a crisis of digital well-being, partially because we've been thrown, you know, we the technology has been there, but all of a sudden it is, it, you have to use it. You can't just sort of say, oh, I don't like technology. I don't want to use it. Or if you're one of those people that does like technology, it's very hard to log off. And so we're getting both of those extremes so much more than we ever had before. And uh, in the books that I wrote about digital self-mastery, we, uh, we looked at a whole sort of range of different types of personas and the different relationships with technology and how that impacts your ability to actually take advantage of the benefits of the technology. And right now we're dealing with the full ends of the spectrum rather than holding to the middle, which is where we were prior to the crisis. I know you've talked quite a lot in the past about the concept of this kind of toxic relationship, as you've described it, and, and almost, I, I guess, sort of seeing your role as um, sort of partly in, in the sphere of kind of helping to heal this toxic relationship with technology. T tell me a little bit more about this, this idea of it being toxic, because I think for some of us, it's a real enabler. It enables us to have maybe a global footprint, whereas we're just a little person on some little island. You know, but for some people, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there that you're talking about something that's really almost sort of challenging them to the core. Well, 
so so to be fair sort of the toxic piece is um it's part of helping people understand the language of where you know what's going on because toxic people relate to so for example when you are you have uh, issues with your diet and you're trying to readjust you you're generally going to do um, you're, you're going to do some kind of a fasting thing where you eliminate everything and then you reintroduce things to try to identify those pieces that are interacting, that are toxic for your particular body. And this, when we work with technology and helping people understand to, and identify the things that are toxic for them, we do a similar procedure. It's like you go down, you take out everything except for what is absolutely essential and you know, there's more that's essential right now just because of our current situation. But then we slowly add things back in again so we can identify those things that are causing behavioral triggers, psychological triggers, or even uh, physiological triggers. So, you know, and, and that can be anything from, you know, not enough to too much movement. Um, because some people are motivated, for example, by the competition piece of, of some of the, uh, the physical apps and they, you know, they can't stop. And then that's also toxic. So it's, it's always the full range. There's never sort of, you know, we like to think that everybody is sort of somewhere in the middle, but um, there really is the widest range and both on the, on the front and, and back end of it. It's almost to me then the way you're describing that is it's, it comes down to something to do with sort of control because it feels that there's this element of almost the way you described about adding in the components back into a level of comfort until something kind of fundamentally changes. So is it that people feel if they're in control of the technology that they're using or that's, you know, being almost like forced upon them, but if they have some level of control and accountability and responsibility for it, it's okay, but it's when it becomes a little bit more over overwhelming am i am i kind of hearing that right well for some it, for for some it is just that behavioral piece and it is control that they need for others it can also be a phys, like i said it's a physiological response or and so sometimes we it's it's more often that it's about building a conscious relationship with your technology and it's really being building an awareness of how you respond and how you re react to things. So yes, there is a control component, but it's it's really more about consciousness and really um, you know using using technology when it is uh, enhancing the human experience rather than detracting from it and enhancing your ability to be productive rather than detracting from it. So it's more about really building a mindful relationship where you can recognize when that shifts. And that's a really interesting one. I, and I guess for um, anybody listening who has children, I guess we're seeing as parents, we're seeing a huge sort of wave of, of behaviours that come through where it isn't necessarily when you look at your child being a parent, you, you look at your child and think, oh, it's now productive. Oh, now it's tripped over and it's gone into the unproductive it's almost being to a point where you see your child almost being subservient to the social network to the interaction to the fact that it's it feels like it's actually you know melded into their hand the the, the mobile device is is that kind of what we're talking about here is it this thing about there's something as you say there's something sort of deeper and intrinsic about the convenience of it the thing that it kind of makes them feel good well, what's actually going on there? Well, I think it's important to separate the device from the functionality for, for one thing, because I think you have, the thing is, what, you know, we as non-digital natives have learned how to use the technology. For them, it is a tool, it is the all-encompassing tool that for us, we still think about the analog version of this is a telephone, this is a calendar, this is a, um, you know, a this is my work piece, this is, you know, a social piece, this is for images, this is my camera. For them, it's just a tool. Like, this is just sort of the tool. And I think it's important to recognize what our own filters are as parents and as adults looking at different generations across it in that um, what we may perceive as negative may be positive for them. Or what we, for example, to make it a little easier to understand. So for example, my son and a lot of young boys and girls 
um, but are were into uh, first person shooter games or um, you know video games. So for me, I'm very anti violence. You know, so my first response was, "This is terrible." You know, what what's going on? So the the second piece was, it's antisocial behavior. This is the way my my mind processes it. Then I spoke with a games researcher, and he really opened my eyes to, uh, to two things. One was the critical component of having a conversation, you know, playing the game with your child, not necessarily, you know, becoming skilled at it, but enough so that you can really understand what their response is to it. So are they processing it as, this is a game, and this is what happens in the game, and here's the strategy of the game, and this is what I'm learning from it? Or is this their escape into another kind of reality where they, you know, they'll have nightmares because they think, oh, I killed someone or, you know, there, there's a, each child, each person is different in how they process that. So that's one thing on the, the violence piece. On the other piece, there's the social aspect. Your, your kid may be sitting in their room playing on video games for hours at a time and you think, oh my goodness, they're going to have antisocial behavior. They're not going to know how to exchange, you know, and play with other kids. Well, they're playing online with other kids. They don't differentiate. This generation does not differentiate between playing in that kind of a game and playing, hanging out, playing basketball. It's still playing with their friends. So when you say like, you know, you need to go be social. I'm worried about like, you're, you know, take a moment and actually listen. Are they having conversations with people while they're doing the game? Are they playing it totally by themselves? Most likely they're playing on Skype with four or five other kids and they may be around the globe. They're probably far more international than you are. So it's important to have those conversations and recognize what is it that they're getting out of it? What is the, you know, is it just a game? Is it, you know, or are they, are they taking it to reality? Is it something they're actually being social, antisocial? Have a conversation with your kids to understand what it is they get out of it. Minecraft is another great one like that, where, you know, you can have kids playing for hours and hours and they're building incredible things. And they're, you know, the, the strategic and the design elements and the spatial relations and what they're getting out of that, that's incredible. And it's a game, it's online, it's in front of a screen. But to us, it's just, oh, get away from the screen. You need to get out. I'm not saying they shouldn't get up and get out and get exercise. Absolutely, they should do that too. But we need to be careful about what filters we're putting on the, the interactions that they're having, whether it's you know, the lifeline of having their buddy, especially right now, where they can't hang out in the park with their friends or they can't go meet and play a game of basketball their lifeline to be able to have that chat with their friends and say, hey, are you still here? I'm still here, is that device. So there's a lovely kind of blend here then between the kind of the social aspect and the technology. So the technology being an enabler for social human interaction. And I guess what you must have seen over the years, because obviously you've been looking into this, um, this whole subject for, for many years now, you, you must have seen a lot of kind of movement in terms of the acceptability of technology and how it you know, is almost like a, um, an expected thing. I mean, particularly in things like the classroom, for example, you know, 10 years ago, technology in the classroom, it's like, put that away. Whereas now, right across the planet, it is very much, it's, it's the way of, of communicating. Well, this is really exciting for me because I worked in education technology 25 years ago and we were working out, I was with a think tank and we were, uh, we were testing, then we were testing the Palm Pilots and using them for kids that were out in the field doing, collecting data and, and sharing them and going on this thing that was the internet. And then of course, you know, then the, back in those days, it was exciting to have an animated GIF. So, I mean, we're, <laughs> you know, that was, it was movement on the page. Um, but still, the, the potential and what's happening now with, uh, with education and with technology is so exciting to me. And not just for youth, but for each of us to, to retrain our brains, to keep constantly educating ourselves and learning and, and being learning beings, which is what is so important for us as humans. But, uh, but also, in particular, the world is going to be a very different place when we come out of this. And we need to be 
we need to really harness the opportunities that are out there to learn new skills, to learn new ways of connecting, to learn new ways of doing the work that we did before, or something that applies those skills. Or, and those skills may not be directly apparent, or it may be time to completely reskill and do something you're passionate about. And find one of, there's so many uh, free courses online right now that it's just ridiculous. There's a glut of them, which is wonderful. It's sort of, you know, for the, the learning addict like myself, it's dangerous because that's where technology is a problem for me. I'm like, oh, I can learn this. I can learn that. I can learn this. There's not enough hours in the day to do it. So you have to be really clear on sort of what is your, what do you want to achieve? What do you want to get out of it? And then what do you need in order to do that? Because there's just, you know, it's like in anything in education, the more you know, the more you feel like you don't know anything um, because you start to really become an expert in it. And I see that with the learning experience with my own daughter who's a junior in high school and now she's done everything online she's like there's just so much information out there there's no way i can learn it all and i'm like it's not about learning at all it's about learning enough to to be able to communicate what you need to communicate to get that goal and i think that's a shift that we're we've been making over the last 25 years with as the internet has grown and the volume of content has grown we have to be able to be much clearer with ourselves and do a lot of internal work to really understand what we need and what we're trying to accomplish so that you don't get overwhelmed by, you know, by trying to consume it all. Mm. So it's interesting, isn't it? When you look at the, the kind of the societal, the, um, the educational piece here, um, it's, I, I guess it's, you know, it's, it's very clear that the, you know, there will be fundamental changes on the other side of this kind of global pandemic that we're all facing right now. How do you see, um, from a, a business perspective, how do you see things like um, new and emerging technologies, AI, for example, um, impacting in business, particularly on the, this whole kind of um, side of things of the, the human in business and their well-being? Well, so to be fair, I am a, I'm a geek to the ground. So um, I can't wait till we have holograms because I love to travel, but I hate to do business travel. Um, so, and I do a lot of it. And, um, and I think that we are going to see after this experience, it's sort of like this giant experiment, just how much travel is unnecessary and just how much can we accomplish without actually physically moving. But we need to find ways that we can make that engagement better. Right now, we're very forgiving on, you know, people doing Zooms from their bedroom and, you know, having their quarantine hair or their quarantine beard. But we are going to get to a place when things get back to the new normal where, where the technology needs to catch up, where we can create spaces that you can have a more assimilated environment where you really feel like you're physically in the same room with people, whether that's through holograms, whether that's through multiple screens, projectors. I think there's a lot of technology that's going to be happening in that space to try to really create that. And I think a lot of it will be through uh, AR, not necessarily VR, because nobody wants to go to a meeting. Well, I shouldn't say nobody, but most most people probably don't want to go to a meeting with a with a headset on their face um, to be able to see their colleagues. But I think if we once we can create environments where we get sort of a 360 picture, you maybe go into a workspace that you check in, and you know you've got your whole you got the whole room there, and each person is able to project their you know, their, their video that is more of a 360 video or at least 3D so you can get a sense of the people physically being there because that piece is important. I mean, you and I are talking over Zoom. We see each other's facial re responses and to, uh, to the conversation, what each other say. Those are critical human elements in terms of communication and dialogue. And it, without that, you're you're missing out on half of the information more than half of the information and the signals that are key in order to really make critical decisions so 
um, that I think that we'll see a lot of development in that space. We'll also see, we'll see everything from sort of the home version and a lot of us who are in the podcasting space fortunately have already our studios. And, and so we're at an advantage there. We can help advise people to get their, you know, to, to identify the right equipment, to be able to get good sound. Good sound is so important when you're dealing with communications, when you have, you know, trash trucks going by or people interrupting the conversation, it interrupts the flow of the connection. Um, the advantage is when you're, you know, like when you're having a podcast interview, you set aside an hour where it's totally free of disruption. Well, what we're seeing now in online meetings is that there, you have that same thing because you've assigned this one hour and you don't have the commute time on either end, you are dedicated to focus for that one hour, especially if you're having to share your video. And so there's that accountability factor. You can't, people can see when you look down or you pull up your phone, there's that, that check-in factor. So what we're, I, I do believe, and I'm an optimist, so to be fair, I'm sure there's other people's viewpoints, but what I'm seeing in, in our space is that there's going to be a much larger demand for, um, for proper systems to support uh, video conferencing, um, more, more in-depth video conferencing, to create studios within uh, shared workspaces so that you can go and sort of check into a quiet space to get the right sound, to get the right lighting, maybe even have people that can help you, you know, get the right look. So that, you know, because you're on the spot, you could be projected on a big screen. What does that mean? Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean like, oh, you have to be gorgeous. It's just, you want to be your best. You want to bring your best to that screen. You don't want, um, you know, a stain on your tie being the thing that people focus on when they're listening to you for an hour. You want, you know, I think there's going to be that, um, that accountability and the, the use of screens much more, which will on the sustainability side, bring down the amount of unnecessary travel, but it'll make us focus on the important events that we need to actually be physically there. So I think there'll be less of them, but they will be more quality. And there will be, when you do have meetings, there'll be smaller groups and so that you can provide for social distancing, but you can actually, you know, it's the key people that are there and you're having a key conversation and it's worth your while. So I think there will be this sort of streaming out of what we don't need. And I think we're doing that as my, my husband says, everybody's Marie Kondoing their lives. And it's, it's really, you know, simplify everything. It's really what, it, what is absolutely essential for us to get the job done so that at the end of the day, we can go back and enjoy the personal parts of our lives and shut off and be offline or use, you know, or, or if you're out on a hike, you know, use your, your, your device as a camera, not as a communication tool. Mm, it's that lovely thing about balance, isn't it, really? Mm. I think what you're describing there is this just, you've talked about, you know, the accountability, you've talked about, you know, using it in, in positive, conscious ways. And I, I really loved to sort of pick up again and that, that word conscious in terms of how to use and how to engage with technology. I mean, one of the things that... Um, I've noticed, obviously, is that you are co-founding a research centre in France. I'd like to delve a little bit into that sure. because it sounds really interesting. I mean, from what I've read about, it's where you're looking to, um, I guess, kind of forge and research best practice in terms of these working and sort of living environments that you've just kind of mentioned there. I mean, how, how do you see that? center really impacting on things like productivity, connectedness, well-being, this whole mix of things that we've been discussing? Well, ideally, I mean, we're putting several different layers of things into practice. So um, from the digital well-being perspective, it's sort of in the, the whole user interface design of the space to, to make sure that there are spaces where you're consciously making a decision, I'm going to be working with technology right now. And then there's other spaces that are completely technology free so that you can have that human interaction without interruption. You have, you know, if you need to go into go do a, a video conferencing, you have the right equipment, the right, you know, the right connection, the right bandwidth. But then as soon as you leave that space, you're consciously leaving to do something else. And so part of it is using some placemaking um, principles where you're really looking at how do you get people to interact and have quality interactions and inspire them to do that. And whether it's in a remote mediated experience 
or a combination hybrid of that. So you can bring other people into the group through a mediated means, by mediated I mean through technology, but then the people that are physically there present are having the most quality direct experience possible. And also encouraging people to take time and space to really focus on personal development and awareness of how they're interacting with that space. So it's during the whole process while they're there, there's sort of these check-in experiences where you're really encouraging people to acknowledge how does it feel to be in this space? How does that, how does that make me feel? Did it, did it improve the quality of my interaction and my experience? Has it improved my productivity? Am I better in this kind of environment? And the idea is to create these spaces so that people can actually take that back to their organizations and apply it in, in the way that they design and create spaces within their organizations, but also the way that they design and create tools that support um, people in other industries. So we designed it with the intent of initially, my husband and I both sit on several advisory boards and we thought, well, we have this space, we can expand it. Why not use this as a retreat space? So then instead of talking about what this experience is, taking our teams there and having them experience it themselves so that they can, they can really understand and live and breathe it for a week and understand how that, how that works and how you can apply it elsewhere. And it is that balance piece. It's understanding sort of how do you, you know, how do you get people to physically move? You know, when you're in an environment where people are constantly sitting in meetings, sitting, 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 and sitting in front of screens. What are things that you can do where you can accomplish the same thing without the screen? What are the things that require a screen? What are the things that, um, you know, what kinds of things are better done through technology? And, and all, the other piece is on the physical piece with the technology, um, each of the suites, for example, has the ability to cut off the entire, the, the Wi-Fi and any kind of signal coming into the room. And there's a docking station, for example, in the office where all of the phones and all the devices go at the end of the day. And it's partly to teach people how to habituate to, to uh, get better sleep because in, in removing the technology from the sleeping space. Now, of course, some guests will say, you know, will opt out and say, you know, I've got to have my technology in my room. That's their choice. But there's, you know, there's an ability within each space to create a blocking zone so that you don't have any, uh, or you have minimized, I should say, the electromagnetic frequencies in each of the suites for sleep. And so there's, part of it is sort of helping people habituate into what feels good and how does this impact my sleep and my ability to be productive the next day. Um, using uh, meditation apps, for example, to start in the morning, or, um, or there are different devices, connected devices that you can use that will have a room for meditation. So you can have shared space to, to do it as a group. Because for some people, they, they prefer to do that type of activity, whether it's yoga or meditation, in a group. They don't, they're, you know, they don't like to do it by themselves. So it's giving people the, the opportunity to have the lived experience of um, well-being, you know, balance with technology in, uh, in a lovely environment, you know, with great food and wine. What couldn't be better? <laughs> wow, what a fascinating, fascinating project. I mean, really, really exciting. I, I guess you could sort of turn that groundbreaking because I can't imagine there have really been these kind of projects of research that kind of blend the, the actual physiological and kind of well-being element with the more kind of practical kind of experiential thing. It's that blending together that for me just sounds, you know, so, so exciting in terms of what that's going to produce. Because if you can be coming up, as you say, with things like best practice in, in these environments, I mean, the opportunity for the world to learn from this it's just, well, it's just breathtaking, isn't it, really? What kind of timescales for kind of results and outputs, or is it too early to say? Well, unfortunately, with the quarantine and everything, it's really too early to say because the construction has been put on hold. Everybody is quarantined at home in France, and we won't be able to get there until probably uh, in the fall, uh, realistically. 
to, um, to continue working with the project. Um, but in the meantime, we're doing a lot of the work on the back end, um, putting together the, the research side so we can make sure we have the checkpoints and we can get the data points from, um, from our guests and participants, but in a passive way so that it sort of becomes a fun part of the experience. So a lot of the design elements are, are happening now uh, in the back end that can be done remotely. So again, it's choosing what we can do remotely and the, but the physical building piece has been put on hold until, uh, until they're able, able to get back to work. So um, I think we're probably, we've been pushed out another year in terms of when it'll be ready, but, um, and then we probably won't get, you know, we'll probably get some good data within six months after that. So I'm thinking about a year and a half from now, we probably will have our first, ro first round of data. Um, and in the meantime, I'm trying to connect with the, uh, you know, hotels and, um, and organizations, you know, smaller sort of luxury or hotels and, and, and resorts that, that host events and host retreats, board retreats and like that to try to help them understand how they can in incorporate some of these principles. So maybe we can get it started in other places as well. Really exciting, really exciting project. And, I, and I'm guessing, well, I'm not guessing, I am. I know that a lot of people watching or listening to this will be thinking, I want to keep in touch with this because this is just too important to have to wait another kind of 18 months, two years to, to find out. Will they be able to kind of keep in touch with that and other sort of related topics on your podcast? Because I want to hear a little bit about your podcast, because uh, this is an opportunity, I think, for people who are genuinely interested in, in digital well-being and the broader topics to really kind of keep in touch with you and your work. Sure. So um, the, we're into the third season of Evolving Digital Self, which is around the human relationship with technology and how it's changing the way we work and live. And from there, we, we interview people in all kinds of different industries. We, and um, the idea is really to just help people understand, one, that it's not industry specific. Technology is everywhere now. And it's even, you don't, can't really even take the, you know, you have to sort of take the word technology out. It's like, how is everything changing? Because I, technology impacts everything. But it's kind of, it, it's, it's fun for me because it's really finding that unifying factor of that we're all going through this major digital transformation and the opportunities to learn from across different industries and that it really comes down to the human relationship with technology in terms of how, uh, you know, sort of where the resistance or the acceptance is in terms of how quickly that transformation can occur and how, uh, how fluid that, really, that, that transformation is and opportunities to learn from each other around it. So that's been a really, um, it's been a, a great podcast for me. I really enjoy it. And uh, like with all podcasting, I love the fact that you get, you know, an hour to sit and, and talk with people completely undistracted and learn about other industries. And I think that's really fun. And um, there's been some really great guests. I've been very fortunate and that I've never had a guest say no. So um, I had some really great people on the show. And um, that's, every other week. We, it was every week, but we've just switched it to every other week to accommodate the new podcast, which is called Global Nomad Hacks. And it does integrate a lot of digital well-being principles into it, but it's um, just because that's where my heart is. But um, I also really wanted to serve the global nomad population, which um, that I felt was not being served. And part of that is, of course, you have you know, digital nomads, people that are location independent and want to, you know, sort of travel the world and, and bring their laptop. There's lots of things that can happen in that space. But for me, it was also looking at expats, both by choice and by force. And how do you serve that population? Are we looking at um, connecting people in the right way with the right tools that they need? Everything from, you know, how do you get insurance that covers you across borders? How do you get um, you know, how do you, if you're moving from one country to another, can you re-register your car? I mean, it's some of those really practical things, but also like marrying someone from a different culture. What does that mean culture-wise? What does that mean legally? What does that mean, you know, how do you find the support systems? How do you connect to the right people? And when things go wrong, even more so, how do you get the support that you need and, and really sharing some of the interesting uh, survive and thrive stories from that. So it was sort of a passion project for me because I've been a global nomad most of my life. Right now I'm sheltered in place in San Francisco and it's probably the most situated I've been um, for a very long time since living in Sweden for 10 years. So, um, so it's, but it is sort of, as soon as we're 
free again, will be back in Europe and, um, and be based out of there uh, as much as possible at the retreat center once that's ready and up and running. So I, uh, for me, it's about really helping the, the organizations that serve the global nomad population because uh, mobility is only going to be increasing rather than decreasing, as we've seen with the large influx that, you know, basically caused a lot of issues. Every time there's a large migration influx, it causes challenges. And, and uh, you know, how do we get these organizations that support that migration and support that transition to really understand the best way to serve them? And my idea is to have the people that are experiencing it share their stories so that we can help serve them, but also bring in some of the ones that are doing best practice and are doing a great job with serving that mobility population. So there are, you know, there's a little overlap between the two podcasts in that I think that technology is going to be a very key factor in terms of that support system. Um, but yeah, so those are my two podcasts and uh, I love them. I, I would one of my favorite things to do um, is to do those interviews. And we'll put the links to the two podcasts uh, directly below uh, this particular recording. So if you're uh, listening to it on the podcast, you'll see it on uh, anchor.fm forward slash Neil Wilkins. And if you're watching this um, on any of the media in which you can uh, view this, uh, you'll see it in the links below. So you can uh, subscribe to Heidi's uh, two podcasts there and they are very, very good. They come highly endorsed by me. Um, thank you. So thank you again, Heidi, for your time today. It's been a really, really fascinating um, journey through digital well-being with so many different facets and so many different elements to it and um, yeah I for one am going to be very much thinking more I think more deeply about how I sort of integrate with the various technologies as I uh, sort of go about my very busy digitally enabled days so thank you again. It's my pleasure thank you for having me Neil. <laughs>